calling this meeting to order. I'm sure it'll happen sooner or later. Okay, we have a meeting, we just don't have order. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, um, approval of the agenda, which you have in front of you. And um, so, any additions, subtractions? There is one, which I just found out. There is one correction. We won't say where this error originated. Um, we'll, we'll keep that quiet. Um, 7A1, the Arts Advisory Com member, com Committee, is not membership diversity. It is what the motion says it's out, which is reviewing the um, CKAF review. Uh, no, it's not. Arts Fund, okay. It's a decade in the making, according to the staff and what they're telling me, and uh, it's been around. So now it has to be reviewed, because that's the way we do things. So, so that's this small, um, <laughs> significant change, and I don't think it's worth worrying about too much. So anyway, does anyone want to move approval of the agenda? Councilor McLaren, and second by Councilor Sanic. And uh, Councillor Holmes is refusing. Okay, so um, what what do you want to do here, McLaren? I said McLaren. Yeah, well, I got my tongue got ahead of itself. I did correct it before I got finished. So um, all those in favor of the agenda. <laughs> okay. Confirmation of the minutes. These ones we discussed. Uh, pretty interesting. The creek, remember the trail, all that stuff. Anyone wish to move that? Councillor Sanic, a seconder. Yay, Councillor Holland. <laughs> and um, any changes, deletions, additions, disputes? <laughs> okay. I've disputed the minutes of my day. They have me saying things I never said. The, um, <clears throat> all those in favor of the minutes? Okay. Why is that 3A when there's only one item? Why is that necessary? Anyway, <laughs> there isn't in this case. So number four, disclosure of pecuniary interest. No one's figured out how to make money off this stuff. Okay. The, um, there's... Uh, None. Delegations, none. Uh, briefings, Ms. Clemens, the chair of the Arts Art Advisory Committee, will present to speak to committee regarding business item B, which is strength and language of art and cultural amenities and official plan. So, Ms. Clemens is my neighbor, so you darn better be good to her, okay? Because I don't want to suffer the consequences. She lives right across the street. <laughs> So it's red. Oh, my goodness. You can come up here if you wish. No, thank you. <laughs> oh. Well, that's where you, Okay, we won't insist this time. Go ahead. Uh, thanks for inviting me here this evening. I'm just here to provide some context on this motion from the Arts Advisory Committee. Um, the official plan uh, is supporting intensification, so the development of downtown to a higher density than currently exists. Um, and this intensification is already happening downtown with a number of proposed or new housing developments, particularly on Queen and Princess Streets. While the housing density is increasing in the city centre, cultural amenities are unfortunately dwindling and many venues for visual art performance, rehearsal and engagement with arts and culture have closed, moved or are struggling to keep their doors open. On the Arts Advisory Committee, we've heard from local visual and performing artists concerned by a lack of accessible exhibition, rehearsal and performance venues in the city centre. Uh, particularly for emerging independent and non-professional artists. We've lost the Wilson Room as a place to display the work of local artists. The Upper Canada Academy, Wellington Street Theatre and Empire Theatre have closed their doors. Modern Fuel and the Kingston School of Dance have relocated from downtown to the Tet Centre. The Artel has also moved, ending its activity as a visual arts gallery and reducing its performance programming. 
downtown venues that host independent visual art and music, such as the Sleepless Goat and Musiki Cafes, struggle to remain viable within the city's regulatory framework. While unique cultural spaces such as these have disappeared, moved, or struggled to keep afloat in downtown Kingston, major chains are moving in, sure to benefit from the increase in traffic associated with intensification, but not offering the same opportunities for local artists, nor reflecting the unique cultural character and vitality of the area. Opportunities for artists and nurturing Kingston's unique character have been emphasized as necessities by the city's sustainable and culture plans, as well as CAP's integrated tourism strategy, but they're not clearly addressed in Kingston's official plan. Though the official plan devotes hundreds of pages to conserving and preserving cultural heritage as primarily defined as our built heritage, there's barely any mention of fostering cultural activity and vitality. Cultural and entertainment amenities are lumped in with retail restaurants and recreation where they're mentioned at all. The city's goal of making itself the most sustainable municipality in Canada is intended to be reflected throughout the entire official plan, and section 2.1 of the official plan references the Sustainable Kingston Plan. Um, however, we have to go to the Sustainable Kingston Plan directly to see that it identifies cultural vitality as one of four pillars of sustainable development, emphasizing the role of art, culture, and heritage in bringing beauty to our daily lives, but also nurturing individual and community identity, promoting social cohesion, uh, and contributing to the creation of social capital, which would all be imperative in this context of uh, intensification and housing density. Further creative, vibrant, and resilient places are attractive to investors and industry business and tourism, and thus create employment opportunities and generally add wealth of the community, says the Sustainable Kingston Plan. Going back to the city's official plans, section 2.8 says that the city will protect, promote, and enhance its cultural resources through the use of the Kingston Culture Plan. Yet again, we have to go to the culture plan separately to see that it also strongly emphasizes the need for cultural amenities downtown, uh, an objective that's not clearly reflected in the official plan itself. Examples uh, from the culture plan include um, page 10, where it says a strong downtown cultural core is dependent um, on a strong mix of uh, retail food and entertainment uses, as well as the mix of contemporary performing and visual arts in the downtown uh, as a significant contributor to our creative and cultural distinctiveness. It recommends a new civic exhibition space in the arts block uh, of the North Block, which is currently on hold pending these other developments. It also says that the Tetzner should be seen primarily as a place for cultural incubation and creative collaboration with prospective tenants, ensuring that they mount exhibitions and performances and program extensively in the downtown core, which hasn't actually been happening much as people are you know, using the new space quite a bit. Um, it also, uh, the cultural plan also mentions that Kingston's one of only a few smaller cities in North America that have sustained a successful downtown. And so we obviously wanna preserve that in this context of intensification. Um, and it also, the cultural plan also mentions that the mix of contemporary performing and visual arts uh, in the downtown, which as we know is now uh, starting to dwindle, has been a significant contributor to its creative and cultural distinctiveness. Um, the culture plan also says that while our built environment speaks to our distinguished history, the juxtaposition of contemporary visual and performing arts throughout the downtown would provide strong and celebratory reinforcement of our motto, where history and innovation thrive. Uh, so as the culture plan states, Kingston should be the city where history and innovation thrive by having a downtown that supports cultural innovation as well as heritage conservation, uh, the Arts Advisory Rec Committee recommends that this can be achieved by strengthening language in our official plan concerning cultural amenities in the city's core. Um, and there are lots of sections of the official plan where this language could be strengthened, um, particularly sections two, three, seven, and nine. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any questions from the committee regarding the um, briefing? Councillor McLaren. Can you speak into the mic, please, Councillor? Sorry. Would it be possible to get a list of the proposed or suggestions or the particular items that you'd like to be put into the official plan, as we will be discussing that with staff? very soon. Um, so the motion coming from the Arts Advisory Committee didn't have any specific recommendations for textual changes in the plan. It's uh, more of a recommendation that language around cultural amenities in the downtown core 
be included somewhere in the plan. Um, and in my research for this briefing, I noticed in the plan some areas where that, that could be applied, but um, the Arts Advisory Committee nor myself have like specific language to include in the plan, but I'm happy to share the notes I made for this briefing. That's a help. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, that would be great. Councillor Holland, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is a question I perhaps more for um, Mr. Wigginton. Uh, but I'm not sure, okay, so I guess first of all to the committee, um, have, in going through and sort of putting together this recommendation, have you um, talked about the idea of cultural hubs and what we are, and, and sort of tied that into um, what we as a council has, have already said that we're hoping to achieve, it, which is providing space that is um, available at low cost or no cost for various community activities and cultural activities. So it seems that concept fits in very well with the idea of um, the exhibition space that's needed in the downtown, but it could be like a citywide um, uh, you know, policy or proposal at some point that we start to look into. Um, so if you could just, I just, am, I guess what I'm looking for, because we talk about this all the time, we still don't really have a strategy, as far as I know, for developing Kingston's cultural hub um, model, I guess. It involves so, so many partnerships that I'm, I'm just, I'm constantly struggling trying to figure out what it means. So if you, if you can speak to it in the context of this, that would be great, or if Mr. Wiginton can just more broadly speak to us about how, what council has put forward as a sort of emphasis on cultural hubs would help or relate to some of the, the issues that you're describing. Through you, Mr. Chair, in response to that question, um, the notion of cultural hubs is a recommendation in the culture plan that we have been pursuing. And I believe uh, in other forums um, involving council, we have spoken about the fact that the Tet Center represents one form of a hub in which we're building the infrastructure and bringing the groups in. Uh, cultural services is also working very closely with recreation and leisure right now around the visioning of the Rideau Heights Community Center so that it can also function as a place that provides cultural programming in that kind of hub setting. And we're looking at models, so you're correct that we haven't necessarily articulated the model, but the work is being pursued with a number of different approaches that probably need to be formalized and communicated. I would think in the context of Mrs. Ms. Clemens' um, briefing is that really what the um, Arts Advisory Committee was speaking about was the fact that because the official plan under review right now and there is the potential for strengthening language, but also specifically identifying the addition of cultural amenities as part of potentially a bonusing program along with other public amenities, that the desire to see that identified um, would be advantageous to the arts community that uh, you know, when a developer is developing a property that they could be encouraged to consider that along with some other items in exchange uh, for the kinds of things that they want to achieve. And right now, that's just not acknowledged anywhere other than with things like public art, green spaces, parking. Uh, so wanting to make sure that there is the capacity. And this is partly also inspired by the design guidelines that were developed for Block 4 which is the city-initiated project that Ms. Clemens referred to that's on hold right now that, that did specifically identify that something that would be considered is artist -led workspace or community exhibition um, space. Uh, so the desire to see that become part of the official plan so it's not just part of a design guideline but part of a uh, ambition of the city to see that kind of amenity supported and developed. And also just to make sure that um, in creating cultural hubs throughout the city with the rapid housing density intensification happening downtown, don't lose sight of the downtown being a main cultural hub <laughs> of the city itself um, because we've been working actively to create these other spaces throughout the city. Um, it seems like there's been less of a focus on downtown and with the number of people moving into the neighborhood, it's going to become more of an issue potentially. Thanks. I, I think I was just something became very clear just listening, uh, which is that there is a bit of a distinction here. One is has to do with development, um, and one has to do with, as you say, the, the cultural hub model that we were actually talking about and executing at the moment is is really public space. 
um, because I was sort of bringing my head around some of the examples that we're using here, the Wilson Room, which is a public facility, um, versus what you're talking about, which is a private development where we're looking for, for public use of space in that development. Um, so I completely understand now why the official plan component is essential here. So thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think the briefing identifies a whole range of spaces, some of which had city involvement, some of which were privately owned, some of which were um, public access, and some of which were independent businesses, but all of them were kind of centers where independent artists and performers could access uh, space for exhibition performance or rehearsal, and, and those are not as available as they are. And through you, Mr. Chair, just to add to that, and I think Ms. Clemens made the point very well that the official plan in its current state as it's being reviewed makes reference to things like the Sustainable Kingston Plan and the Kingston Culture Plan, which has those ideas embedded in them, but doesn't necessarily make them explicit enough to set the stage for encouraging that kind of activity just across the board and then having that additional tool on the part of the city to uh, encourage developers to consider that as well as in addition to the kinds of activities the city might lead or, the, or you know, another community group might lead. Okay, uh, Council Ken. Thank you, and through you. Uh, just a question I had, because I'd only gone to the one uh, meeting that we had, uh, and. I, I wasn't sure if we did, if it was, if we were offered a space, have we prioritized exactly what would be the first priority to fill a certain space, or have we got a definite uh, outline of what would constitute, what would be the highest priority, or what's missing the most? Um, so, for example, if somebody came and knocked on the city's door tomorrow and said, "I want to uh, provide two or three thousand square feet for what we're what we're looking for." We, would we have an answer, yes, we want to put this in there, or would we have to go right to the drawing board to create something to facilitate that need? Through you, Mr. Chair, it's, it's probably a little bit of both. For example, with the North Block, the idea that uh, there might be the inclusion of a workspace, then that would be the provision of affordable housing and workspace for artists, so that's something the developer would uh, potentially bring to the development that would have a direct relationship with the community. The uh, design guidelines and the Kingston Culture Plan also refers to an, an exhibition venue, and that is something that if a developer were to suddenly decide they wanted to do that, there would have to be some legwork because one of the questions that also keeps being asked, even though the public has expressed that desire, is then what is the operating model? Is it something that the city is then expected to operate or is it a space that would be made available to some sort of community-led organization under you know, its own standalone board that would operate? So there would need to be some discussion. So it's not necessarily shell ready to use that term, but mm -hmm. uh, there's definitely a will. Uh, so depending on what a developer would bring forward would really determine then what the next steps in terms of discussion would be. Okay. And at this juncture, are we actively trying to participate in new projects that are taking place downtown kind of as they come along? Or do we, are, as of right now, we're just putting this in the official plan as a, as a starting point? Or are we actively in the community now trying to create these spaces today and tomorrow. Through you, Mr. Chair, I mean, obviously we did that very actively with the TET, that was a very purposeful right. city-led initiative, right. but the uh, Block 4, which my understanding is is a city-owned property that the city was looking to encourage development of and, and developed the design guidelines that it was intending to try and provide that cultural amenity through a city-led process as opposed to some of the other properties within that same sphere that are being led by private developers. And so they would then be beholden to the terms of the official plan. And that's where the, the strengthening in language, I think, would be useful that for someone uh, coming forward with a project that isn't being initiated or driven by the city, that there would be the opportunity for that uh, exploration and discussion. OK. My, my day job, I am involved in intensification like quite heavily. And I have ran this by a few different people, and, and it's been perceived quite well on the other side. So they're like, that's kind of a cool option. And so I wasn't sure how it was going to be perceived uh, with the handful of people I spoke to, but the do people I have spoke to, like, absolutely, that sounds like something a community needs. You know, we, if you look at a community like a recipe, you need a lot of different ingredients. And if this is an ingredient that we've overlooked, 
then we need to make sure that that ingredient is is included to have a to have a, a good meal. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, my question is uh, this. Um, <clears throat> clearly, to me, to me, you can correct me, the, the, the importance of this is the official plan is, as the name indicates, a uh, fundamental planning policy. While the other two policies, the cultural plan and sustainability plan, not so much. And uh, so on the statuses of those two plans, I was wondering if Mr. Wigginton could elucidate or clarify for me. Um, I can see why this, this is being brought forward. We want to get in the official plan. I like what Councillor Cannon was saying that we're being kind of, this is just like the passive first step when may perhaps we should be more active in reaching out or pushing the idea more. But uh, I just want to be clear about this, the relative status statuses of the sustainability plan, the cultural plan, relative to development proposals. Like how much attention has to be given to those. I know you're, we're trying to do it, but that's not the same as the official plan, which basically says these are the guidelines. You should be sticking inside them or you need an amendment. Okay. So in response to your question, I think the key thing to keep in mind is that because uh, the municipality is legislated to review and update its official plan on a five-year cycle, this is the first opportunity that we've had since the creation of the Sustainable Kingston and the Kingston Culture Plan. Both of those were approved in 2010, so it was on a timeline after the last review of the official plan. So this is the first time that we have an opportunity to look at the official plan as you're describing an official document that is used for planning purposes that allows us to articulate the kind of vision that's brought forward in both the Sustainable Kingston and Kingston Culture Plans. And while the, uh, and I can only speak in this de detail with the Kingston Culture Plan, it doesn't necessarily explicitly state, make changes to the official plan, but it certainly speaks around that need to do with intensification and the kinds of issues that Ms. Clemens has referred to in terms of making sure that the downtown in particular is, has, uh, is known for its cultural vitality, so we don't want to miss that opportunity. And in tandem with this, I can speak to the fact that the uh, official plan has had some heavy revisions in this round to also reflect um, some of the Kingston culture plan as it relates to cultural heritage. And there's been tremendous change made in terms of expanding that uh, dialogue and definition beyond built heritage to look at cultural heritage and all of its uh, layers and complexity and to make sure that with the official plan, Kingston as a municipality has the opportunity to really give voice to the notion of us being a, a heritage community where you know history and innovation thrive as was referred to that the cultural ambitions of the community are embedded within the official plan and also those notions of sustainability. So it really is to do with this first opportunity to bring those values and beliefs forward and embed them in the official plan in this moment as a tool for then future growth and development within the community. Fair enough. What I take from that is it was wishing before and now we want to make it official. Okay, that sounds good to me. Um, Anybody, any other questions of the, um, Ms. Clemens giving the briefing? Okay, not seeing any, we'll pass on to the business portion of the agenda, which is item 7A, is a report received from the Arts Advisory Committee. Um, it says, Arts Advisory Committee and Councilor Candon, we realize that membership diversity <laughs> comes from another agenda. Um, and I don't mean that politically. It's it's <laughs> it's, uh, it's a typo, <laughs> and that's why you don't see anything in the motion that says anything about diversity. So um, if you just scratch that, we'll all be happier. So what we have here is, um, and thank you to Ms. Clemens. Uh, I don't know if you want to leave now or hang around for when we might have something else to say because they were supposed to be asking questions. They were doing a really good job of making statements with questions on the ends of them. But um, so, you know, 
It depends how much torture you can stand, okay? So, anyway, that the revised Kingston Arts Council plan for administration of the arts funding for the Corporation of the City of Kingston Arts Fund 2016, attached to Exhibit C, to report, oh boy, AAC 15, the double knot one, be approved. Okay, so that's what this is about. And the staff be directed to hire a consultant to complete a major review of the City of Kingston Art Fund program to complete it in advance of 2017. And arts funding year, and that the Art Advisory Committee reestablish the CKAF Review Working Group and appoint committee members to assist staff and develop the request for proposal needed to hire a consultant um, to complete this work. So, I'm a, um, is it the motion? Is the motion? Pardon? Yeah, we can just get the motion on the floor since there's no public. Councillor Sanic. Councillor Holland, thank you. So I think we'd like to just hear a bit from Mr. Wigington. We'd like to clarify what this is all about, and then we can have questions, OK? Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, the motion that's in front of you comes from the previous Arts Advisory Committee meeting that happened on December 10th. And this is part of the service level agreement that we have with the Kingston Arts Council that every year they're required to do a review of the administration plan. Um, seek consultation with the public and with recipients of the grant and uh, jury members and make revisions and bring it back for implementation in the following year. So the administration plan has gone through that review process. It has been modified. And the report that was tabled, the Arts Advisory Committee summarized what those changes are. And uh, it's since been approved by the KAC board. And, and this is now an endorsement from the Arts Advisory Committee that they would like to see uh, York, this committee, approve it as it's been revised. Uh, what makes this a little bit different than in past years in terms of this kind of process is we're also picking up a couple of threads from a couple of years ago where um, City Council, through this committee, asked for staff to look at the issue of the possible inclusion of funding for deaf and disabled artists as an aspect of CCAF. Uh, so that's an issue that uh, we've still been needing to address and something that we hope to do as part of the larger review. And the larger review itself came from the work of the CCAF Review Working Group that was formed under the Arts Advisory Committee two years ago to look at the program as a whole. And there was a process that Council endorsed at that time uh, that included a revision of the objectives of the program and also the acceptance of 10 uh, short-term, mid-term, and long-term recommendations. And some of those have been acted upon, but in order to complete that work, to, to close the loop, as it were, on the recommendations of that working group, uh, we really need to do a full uh, review and assessment of CCAF as a program and its success and relevance in you know, the changing environment of Kingston. The program did come online in 2007, so what we're uh, suggesting in consultation with the Arts Advisory Committee is that the program be reviewed and that any changes that might come out of that would be in place then really at the 10-year mark of the program's implementation to ensure that it's still reflecting best practices, that it uh, has addressed the issue of diversity and inclusion, and that if there is a desire to see any modifications in terms of the kinds of things being funded or the addition of funding streams, that those kinds of questions can be asked and, and answered through a process of further public consultation and uh, the kind of work that's required to bring that uh, fuller kind of review back to Council for consideration. Thank you. Any questions on this, in this regard from the committee? Councillor Sanek. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. So this is the first time that we've hired a consultant to do the review, because this is a 10-year review. Is that what we're saying? Before, it was always that subcommittee that would, well, that, um, <laughs> that committee that we formed specifically to do a review, and that always came to council every year. But this is the first time hiring a consultant to do an overall big review. Is, that's what we just said then? Through you, Mr. Chair, just to clarify that point, yes, you're correct. And that annual review has largely focused on um, the effectiveness of how the program is administered and sort of making smaller changes along the way. 
Uh, but uh, for those of you who maybe have been around the council table longer, when uh, CCAP first came online back in 2007, essentially it was authored by the Kingston Arts Council based on desire of the Arts Advisory Committee at that time to have a funding program that would support operating and project grants. So really what we have the opportunity to do now is to revisit the large scale objectives of the project or the program and whether it's actually achieving what the community needs now all these years later. So that's what we're really looking for is that large scale review to make sure that it's effective in doing what the city wants it to achieve. Okay, that's great. And we have it in the budget already and how much do we have in the budget approximately for this uh, consultant review? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, um, this money is in our capital budget within cultural services as part of the ongoing implementation of the Kingston Culture Plan. And there's an envelope right now of, um, actually there isn't a designated amount, but it's with, we, we're carrying quite a bit of capital related to the implementation of the culture plan. So it would fall under that. And so we're gonna author the RFP with the help of a working group that's referenced here and uh, put that out to, to tender for people to respond to and, and uh, get a sense of how much that would actually cost us. And my last question is, do you think there'll be some local groups or, you know, like um, organization, consultant, do you think there's going to be a conflict of interest problem? I guess they would have to clear a conflict of interest. You know how for all this art stuff, there's always that, you know, well, it's not really fair that this person is sitting on this review committee because they're in competition with this and so they're not going to be fairly, you know, there's always that issue there and I just wonder... I guess we won't know till we put the RFP on the street and see who replies back. Well, and through you, in response, through you, Mr. Chair, in response to that question, that's exactly the issue that we're dealing with. Many of the members of the Arts Advisory Committee are also recipients of funding through the City of Kingston Arts Fund, and what we really need at this time is the opportunity to hire a third party who we hope has that objectivity, who can come in, can help with the community, hear what uh, the desires and issues are, address that history of some concerns that have been expressed around the program and, and bring the most sort of objective uh, recommendations forward then for council's consideration. Good, anyone else? Any questions? So just um, to follow on that, um, if we were to be, you gave one of the reasons why is uh, to have a consultant was to breathe some um, separation into the uh, uh, independence into the process and um, so presumably we're looking for a consultant that doesn't live here or something like that <laughs> um, <clears throat> so is there any other reasons why we need a consultant other than staff can uh, got too much workload to do it themselves um, because that might be something we're questioned about the way things have been going. So I'd like to have a ready-made answer, if you don't mind. <laughs> in response to your question, I think part of the issue too is that in the time that the Arts Fund has been operating, there's been fairly significant change within public and government granting programs generally uh, in all kinds of municipalities and at the provincial and the federal level as well. Uh, right now there's a wholesale uh, revamp of the Canada Council for the Arts that's coming online, which has been a major change to the way that program's operating and embedded in that is also uh, increased interest and attention on issues of equity and making sure that programs such as, as the Canada Council for the Arts are reflective and inclusive of artists of color, different, uh, different abilities, first peoples, and I'm not sure that in this moment that city staff actually have the expertise and the capacity to bring that level of experience and knowledge to bear on this. So we really need to look at the emerging trends across Canada in terms of kinds of government programs to make sure that ours is equally reflective of those trends and changes within uh, these kinds of funding programs. So I would say that that's part of the answer as well. And I would also um, hazard a guess that there's probably a perception that staff are also perhaps too close to the program as we do actively participate in, um, you know, the obviously the review process every year. We sit ex officio on the juries, but we're, you know, we're there as part of the discussion. And I just think there's certainly value in trying to make it further uh, removed in terms of that arm's length process. 
Thank you. Well, that was useful. Um, now, we've had our questions. Do counselors have any comments they wish to share with the vast and myriad public? Ms. Ms. A counselor or something? Well, the review should be good if we can get it really objective. And um, so I look forward to it. Independent, yeah, I know. <laughs> Because um, we have had, you know, concerns raised to us over the last 10 years. So if we can then, in the future, we get any objections, we can point to the review that was done in 2016. You know, um, that's one way to, you know, help that transparency. So, yeah, this should be good. Yeah, that sounded good to me. And uh, we do hear these things, and it hasn't been that bad, has it really been? I, I, but... But the problem is kinks is not that big, right? So that's really what the problem is, right? Everything's incestuous, so what can you do? So we'll stop that, perhaps. Maybe I don't think we want to be transparent about that, but uh, you know, I'm just kidding. Okay, if there's no other, any other comments from the committee? Okay, not saying that. We have the motion on the floor. And uh, moved by Councillor Sanic, seconded by Councillor Holland. All those in favor? And it passes unanimously. Thank you. I just uh, make a little note here that Councillor Sanic pointed out transparency. So uh, now, 7B, yet another report from the Arts Advisory Committee. And it's about strengthening language of art and cultural amenities in the official plan. I'll, I'll just say, the Councillor Cannon, I don't know if you were here. Uh, but Ms. Clemens did a briefing on that, okay? So, if you, um, so I'm quite sure you can ask questions to her by, you know, circumventing the rules. I won't be too strict. Yeah, no, no, I'm just teasing you and allowing you an opening. <laughs> Counselor, uh, I haven't read the damn thing yet. Hang on. Um, whereas commitment to intensification of the city is reflected in the official plan and whereas the cultural plan recommends the inclusion of cultural venues as part of the downtown development and whereas the Arts Advisory Committee is aware of official plan review and the ability that document guide development and whereas in the light of the loss of cultural venues in the downtown Kingston such as the Wilson Room, the Upper Canada Academy for Performing Arts and the Empire Theatre. Therefore, be it resolved that the official plan strengthen language with regards to inclusion of arts and cultural amenities and future developments, particularly in the city's core. Okay, so... Councillor Senek. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is just a process question. So when we pass this tonight, um, do we have to add wording and to say, and it be forwarded to our planning staff persons collecting all the um, public comments uh, for the official plan, or will that just happen automatically once we pass it? So it'll go to council, actually, um, not next week, but the week after. And then from there, it'll obviously go to um, Commissioner Hurdle and her staff to include in the comments. And then just a question of timing to my fellow councillors. We've already seen the ad for the official plan amendments, right? The five-year review. And when was it? It was it um, February 23rd. February 23rd. So I guess that would allow enough time with the minutes or... This would be at next week's meeting? Like, will tonight's meeting be at next council meeting on, I guess not, on Tuesday night? Right, don't we meet? <laughs> no. We have council on Tuesday night, right? Oh, yeah, that's the special meeting, yeah. No, no. I, I guess we would have enough time regardless, even if it was the second meeting of February, right? Yeah, it's Tuesday. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Any other um, questions about this motion? Okay. Not seeing any. Um, we need a mover and a seconder. Councilor McLaren, seconded by Councilor Candon. Um, any comments? None. Okay. So Ms. Clements can go away thinking she was incredibly persuasive. Right? 
Okay, they're not saying anything. I'd be careful. Yep. <laughs> so, okay, all those in favor of this motion? Yay, we did it. It's unanimous. So, item 7C, report received from the Housing, Homelessness, and Advisory Committee. Review of four directives issued under the Housing Services Act. And I quote, that the Housing and Homelessness Advisory Committee recommend to the Arts, Recreation, Community Policies Committee of the Council approve the amendment of directives H 1310 and H 1314, attached as Exhibit A to report number HHC 16002, and the directives H 1308 and H 1309 remain in effect in their current form. So, um, Anyone wish to move this motion? Councillor Sanic. Seconded by Councillor Holland. Okay. Um, I read this. I'm in, as you know, the sector. It's not exactly earth shaking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mostly we're running, but not moving anywhere. So, has anyone got any comments? Feel free. <laughs> say without wish. None. I don't see any comments. Okay, so um, <laughs> um, all those in favor? Okay, we got to move, right? Yep. Okay. Good. Passes unanimously again. So that gets us very close to the end. And I don't see any, no any notice of motion. Nobody. Any other business? Nothing too personal, okay. Uh, seeing none. Um, correspondence, I don't think it was any. None. Date and time of the next meeting is February 25 at six o'clock sharp, unless you're in another meeting, and then you won't be sharp. So, <laughs> and um, adjournment, we need a mover. Councillor Hodge, you can wait. Councillor uh, Cannon can have the second, <laughs> okay. Okay, we're done. Finish like dinner. <laughs> well, actually, I didn't have dinner, so I didn't really know. <laughs>